I don't, I don't actually have anything against Windows users, believe it or not, or Windows themselves. But uh, <laughs> some of my I'm best friends are Windows it. users. <laughs> 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 Hello and welcome to the Linux lads, but with a difference this time. Um, today we're going to do something different. Uh, with us we've got Wayne and Mark from the Binary Times. So uh, today is basically the Linux lads slash Binary Times Christmas mashup special team up extraordinaire. Mark, Wayne, how are you? Doing really well, thanks. Yeah, can't complain at all. Yeah, it's always a pleasure having you on. Um, and of course, I'm Shane. I'm Connor. And I'm Mike. So uh, today we've got not not really a, a solid plan in mind uh, because it's the season, you know. Everybody's coming to the end of the year. Everyone's kind of kind of winding down for the for the season. Uh, we thought we'd just go with a little bit more of a, a loosey goosey conversation episode because, as we all know, there's plenty to talk about in the Linux world over the last few weeks. So as there always is. <laughs> so, uh, Mike. You've been very silent so far. Why don't you lead us into the first uh, thing we're going to talk about? Okay, right. So um, <laughs> this is not actually any any news to anyone, but it's a very interesting conversation nevertheless. Uh, as everybody knows, uh, the, what you call it, that thing that uh, people are apparently using for computing, Windows. Windows 7 uh is gonna be or like the plug is gonna be pulled of its support and it's gonna die um in january this year or that next year january 2020 and mm. that means that a lot of people who are still using it for god knows what reason are gonna have to make the decision are they gonna keep using an unsupported system are they gonna go and uh I don't know, try to reinstall or install Windows 10 or then computers, which might be difficult because it's bound to be old hardware. Or are they going to say, are they going to go and buy new equipment with new Windows? Or maybe are they going to try Linux? So basically discuss. <laughs> I don't know about this. <laughs> uh, you're forgetting the five to 10 years of legacy support that they're going to give to VIPs um, for Windows 7, because that always happens. There's, yeah, there's VIPs always some only, people. Yeah, there's always some people though they have to keep supporting, so it's it's you know. Okay, well, but if you if, if you're not the UK government or the likes of then uh, and you don't have spare mil taxpayer millions somewhere, then uh, uh, well, you know, and those probably are not listening to us anyway, so we can <laughs> safely discard. Uh, we can safely discard entities who can afford to mm. waste. Uh, uh, millions upon millions on uh, uh, getting extended support from from Microsoft. I, I just think it's a bit of a leap, though, to say that they're going to jump ship to Linux straight away. I mean, there's always Windows 10, and that's not fantastic either. But, you know, I prefer Windows 7 to Windows 10 almost. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. What do you think? Sure. I think, like, this topic came up. Well, okay, I, I, I will hold my hand up there and I'll just say I, I threw this into the mix because we're doing this at work and I'm the person who has to implement whatever the company decides, whether we go to uh, Windows 10 or whether we actually try and put Linux in some of the machines. And those who listen to our show will know that I, I, I try my best to throw Linux on as many machines as I can get away with. And unfortunately, that's not very many. So we are looking at a position where we've got to upgrade about seven well, 60, 70 machines. And um, I have to say their decision, much to my disappointment, was to put Windows 10 on them. So I've spent the last couple of weeks um, much going against the grain of every cell in my body, um, installing Windows 10 on about 60 to 70 computers at my workplace because they want to stick with the familiarity of a Windows environment. And I totally agree with what you're saying, Shane. You, you don't just jump ship to Linux. There's a whole load of, um, there's a whole load of backend infrastructure almost that nearly needs to be changed in order to accommodate a Linux in, uh, in the work environment. I mean, do you, do you then get rid of Active Directory and Windows Server and install some of the more Linuxy based server setups? I mean, it's a huge change. And, 
Unfortunately, I think Windows is going to win out on this. But this topic came up for me just because I've read so many articles out there online about now is the opportunity for companies to do this. But are they going to do that? Yeah, that's um, just talking about articles. That Vivaldi article uh, I thought was very well written on um, replacing Windows 7 with, with Linux. You know, they covered everything and they made a good argument to to replace Windows 7 with Linux. You know, I, I, and, I know myself, yeah... Go on. I, I've I've very I um one hundred percent agree with you there. I've read I read that article. Um, uh, Wayne, I th- I think is coming from the from the enterprise kind of uh, office environment rollout position. And Mark, I think you're you're kind of um, hinting at the just ordinary people who've gone into PC world and they've uh, they bought their laptop what three or four years ago and it was running uh, Windows Seven at the time or or uh, but certainly they bought their laptop before Windows Ten was available and it's running Windows Seven currently and they're getting this 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 timer saying oh scary scary you will run out of support so i can certainly see things from both point of views both as as a consumer and also from the um from the enterprise point of view as well um but yeah that that, that vivaldi article was quite well uh, written and can i think somebody it, it? sorry guys uh, for the us who didn't read it and that probably encompasses a huge audience can somebody just very quickly summarize what the article was about what they said i i have it here um they basically the title of the article is why you should replace windows 7 with linux and they explain that uh windows 7 is about to go out of support and um they basically tell you what is so good about linux that you should replace uh, your Windows setup with Linux. And they just tell you that um, it's the smartest option you have. Uh, They also tell you um, what distributions you can use. They mention Ubuntu as a popular distribution. Uh, They also suggest Solace, which I was a bit surprised at, to be honest, because I wouldn't consider Solace a, a distro that you would try and introduce uh, new users to Linux with. Okay, so that is an interesting question. If Because I don't think we are going to be solving the question if people are going to switch. Some of them are, mostly probably they aren't. But what would you then recommend to people who are switching? Because... Uh, that is something that we can influence, you know, because with something, if somebody is looking into switching Linux, maybe they will go through some media. We might be one of them. So, what would you recommend to to people who switch to Linux from Windows Seven? It would be entirely dependent on the. Uh, I could think of uh, about five distros off the top of my head, but it would be entirely dependent on how tech savvy the user is. If the if the user is a very non tech savvy person, and I'm talking about all they do is. Uh, they click on Google Chrome and they access their emails and they access YouTube and their Netflix from there. And to them, that is all they use the computer for. The computer is is, is just a facility for getting on the internet. And anything more complicated than that is likely to confuse them. Um, I would gear them towards something like Zorn OS, uh, Linux Mint, um, Elementary OS, if they're possibly if they're coming from the Mac side of things, or if if that side of things that usage paradigm kind of speaks to them. But if they if they're a moderately um, tech savvy user and they don't mind tweaking or, um, the operating system to their needs, maybe something with um, that has KDE Plasma on it, uh, like Kubuntu or something like that. I'm actually very surprised that you didn't mention Ubuntu Mate because Ubuntu Mate for me with the yeah with the welcome screen and the software boutique and everything I think makes it an absolutely brilliant distribution to introduce new users to because the welcome screen gives them everything they need to kind of get started and the software boutique has a really nice selection of applications to get them started as well and for me kind of it helps new users really get into the system really quickly because you know they're doing stuff yeah i would have said linux mint myself um i just think linux mint coming from a windows perspective is definitely the 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 number one 
choice for me because that's what I uh, I had a my my mother and uh, other people had just random laptops that were shy that had Windows on them. So I said, "Fuck it, I'll just put Linux Mint on it." They didn't lose any files or anything. So my my mom just found it easier than Windows. She said, "There isn't all those annoying pop ups." that just assault you every time you boot up, boot up the computer she can just go on click the start menu it's the same sort of ui generally speaking that as windows you know and it, mm. i find it easier to use than windows i find windows fights against you instead absolutely like, i mean i don't mean yeah. to be like arbitrarily windows bashing just because we're linux guys but it's true like windows is not a smooth experience half the time I would no. go against the advice of giving them the environment they know already. Like, I would try to say, okay, you are using Windows 7 on an old computer and you are probably fairly familiar with how it works. Try something completely different. For a month, just throw yourself at the deep end. Maybe you start loving your computer again. Maybe you'll find something interesting. Maybe you find, like, even new communities, new friends. Just don't try to recreate the Windows 7 experience straight away. If you find out that you really, really, really just want mm. to want to browse the internet and that's all you need a computer for, definitely, yeah, sure, then you can install Linux Mint. But please try other things, which, since you are switching already, and there is a cost to switching no matter what you did. There is no like 100% replacement for Windows 7 or any other operating system. Even Linux Mint is going to have a curve. So just don't try to emulate it straight away try to play with it it's a new experience and it can be very it can be something amazing exciting you know if you try just to emulate the experience on windows 7 which i assume people didn't really love because if people love computers they would upgrade and if they love windows they would probably upgrade to windows 10 you know uh, so i assume these people are just fairly you know stuck in their waves maybe try something new you know, uh, kick yourself out of your comfort zone and uh, take it as an opportunity to, to for an adventure. And I think that is that that could be something really uh, that could be a good advice to, to do to give to switching to people switching from Windows. I find though that the Linux community sort of ignores um, a large section of people, like subconsciously almost. I mean, consciously we acknowledge it, but I feel it's very rarely catered to in in the Linux world. Is that some people, like the vast majority of computer users, as we've kind of said, other people have said today in various ways, like the vast majority of computer users don't give a shit. Like <laughs> they don't care about the computer itself, and they're never going to. So we need to present it not in a way oh it's a bit of a challenge but it's really fun it's fun for us but it's it's not going to be fun for them they just want to use it the, the computer so i think we may need to make more efforts to kind of push like just the thing itself just look this goes on your computer it's free it doesn't cost anything or it costs very little and you can still do everything you want to do but just a little bit quicker and a little bit less ha a little bit more hassle free Wayne, I think you've been trying to get in for a while there. <laughs> uh, thanks very much, Shane. Thanks very much. Um, I'll, I'll give you that two quid later. Um, the, so just two things based on, um, on on things that you have been saying. Uh, firstly, uh, just to give a very simple use case, because I do, I am in, involved in support for IT for, a, I don't know, I don't know what to call it. I'll call it a school. And um, and on a very simple example, I've I gave... One user, I needed them to use the web interface of Outlook while I fixed their local client. They nearly, I mean, unfortunately, they were on the web interface for two days. I was doing my best. I mean, we're working on a very old version of Outlook and all that sort of stuff. And um, and uh, they nearly, they threw such a fit about having to use the web interface of Outlook. Now, if it's such a simple thing as, um, I, I promise I didn't come on here to talk about Microsoft products because that's all I've spoken about since I've been on here. I'm, I'm trying <laughs> to enter Linux into the conversation somehow. But the... Um, but but so the, so their level of change was like th their ability to change or their willingness to change was in my mind non-existent and so if i'm looking at trying to get a user to move from windows to linux and i can't get them even to move from a, a, a client version of outlook to a a web-based client I've kind of given up, if I'm to be honest with you, and I just go there and do my job now. And actually, if there are instances where I do put in Linux servers, I kind of do it without telling anybody. I won't mention my employer just in case they're listening. And um, <laughs> but the but also so, so that's one thing. And and the other thing I will just say, based on what you've been saying so far, is 
again, I'm coming from the work environment. Most people do still sit at desks, it seems, unless you're out in the field and you're carrying a tablet or a laptop or whatever, whatever device it is these days. A lot of people do still sit at at, at QWERTY keyboards and, and mouse that, mice that you move with your hand and look at, at, look at, you know, screens and use this desktop or whatever. Maybe it comes in a small form factor now. That's about as far as it's moved on, as far as I'm concerned. So they still need some OS to put on top of that. But uh, w- what I found, again, dis- disappointing just from the work area that I work in is a willingness to embrace what could be a free license um, a free licensed OS, GPL2, GPL3, whatever, a licensed OS that they would never have to pay for again, that gets continually updated, but it is just different. But then uh, those are two different cases. One is uh, the home user who uses a computer at home. And about those, all I'm saying is you will never find out if you don't try. So maybe pushing them a little bit out of the comfort is a good thing. Like in any walk of life, like change constantly every time, progress. That's the best that can happen to you in life. In my opinion, it's my philosophy. So, But the second one is a different problem. So you have a problem dealing with the business uh, decision makers for want of a less douchey, less douchey term, right? So you want to be, how do you explain to them that everybody in their company is to use Linux? That's a different story that I don't, no, really. Does everyone have to use Linux? I mean, I think horses for courses, if you can get it in in some places, um, you know, just keep on plugging away at it. You know, like, I mean, a, des- a desktop should suit the user. True. The cleverest implementation I ever saw was uh, this company I worked for had uh, IBM Blade servers and uh, they were running Red Hat, I believe. And in Red Hat, they were virtualizing uh, Windows environments. So what they would then do is they would just VNC them out to thin clients that everyone had connected to their peripherals. And it was really handy. It was a great system because you could immediately like switch your desktop over to a different terminal, like in a second, like it was very clever. Um, so that's the kind of the cleanest implementation I've ever seen. But, uh, and I think that's kind of a good compromise. You know, they're running Linux servers, but they're, you know, they're running virtualized Windows instances in them. And it wasn't even individual instances, I guess. It was just different. Um, I, I don't know the terminology, but it was the just the, the, the user-facing part of Windows, but like having multiple, you know, TTYs and Linux, that kind of thing. I genuinely do not know the answer to, to this question, and I'm not necessarily expecting that any of the hosts here know uh, the answer to this question, so I'm just throwing it out there. But are there Linux viable alternatives to Active Directory to to uh, well, group policy? I'm, I'm assuming you you will be able to do it as um, scripting or something like that. Again, I'm not familiar, but I would, I would say that those kind of group policy uh, rollouts would be easy to do in Linux, I'm assuming. Correct me if I'm wrong. But... Um, Active Directory and you, the the user account and the fact that their mail account is is linked to their to their um, uh, login when they're logging into the computer that is all synced up. Is there genuinely a, a viable alternative to that uh, in in Linux? Um, yeah, and absolutely. Yeah, that stuff is like baked into Linux itself, really. If you think about it, like okay. uh, user management and. Uh, <clears throat> user management and uh, because mul- think about it like in the origins of linux that's what it, the, the hardware it was built for Multi-user was mainframes yeah. and uh, remote terminals so that stuff's been in linux for decades um so that's that's the crazy thing yeah. <laughs> yeah that's the crazy thing about it like it does all this shit that windows needs extra stuff for and it's just baked right into you could do you could run an email server through linux if you wanted like it's all in there you could do. I wouldn't I say there's, there's extreme... many, um, sorry, uh, I wouldn't say there's many that do it as cleanly as Microsoft. Now, what do I mean by that? Off the top of my head, when you asked, Connor, there's a couple of things. There's this package called RASDC, I think it's called, R-A-Z-D-C, that actually is a um, user management system, single sign-on system for that you can use, that you can install on a server. And it kind of 
piggybacks Active Directory in some kind of way. Uh, sorry, I might be talking off uh, on my head there, but um, there is another one called Univention, UCS, which is a fairly, a much bigger company um, that provide a single sign-on Kerberos authentication, some sort of um, group policy. It won't be as baked in as the Windows one, I don't think. The group policy stuff is 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 the stuff that Active Directory does really well. Um, but there definitely are some products out there. But I just feel if I was to walk away from this this school that I work for, they also want somebody who can walk in and manage the system. And they'll have a much easier time picking up a Microsoft administrator than they will picking up a Linux administrator. Mm. There, is, there is that. There is that as well. There is the bus factor is the whole thing of, OK, so we employed this guy, a, an IT guy, and he set up our entire IT system. He's been working for us for, for 20 years. If that guy ret- retires, gets hit by a bus, yada, 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 how easily can we replace him? And if it's if it's a custom tailored system that only that guy knows about, then there'll Not be easily. 50 grand, 100 grand down to Swanee, um, either um, try to, trying to, f- spending a very long time trying to find somebody who does understand that custom setup or completely replacing it exactly. with something generic, Windows based, that they know that the, um, they could, uh, the knowledge is out there and they, um, the uh, similar engineers, they could just pick one up very easily or well, relatively easily. Yeah, God, for a Linux podcast, we've sure talked about Microsoft <laughs> for about 20 minutes now. <laughs> I, 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 do, I do apologize. It's, it's, it's kind of my day to day work job. So. Yeah, oh, yeah. Don't worry. I have to put up with it in work a lot. Like we all use, we're Windows everything. So, yeah, Outlook, SharePoint, the whole shebang. Yeah, we'd all want to put Linux into organize, our, our organizations. Is that oh, fair? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I mean, mine's. Kind of half and half, uh, okay. uh, Windows and Linux and some Macs. So I would obviously like everybody to use Linux. And there is also a BSD guy in there somewhere. But I, I'd like to, I'd like to everybody to use. But I think some people shouldn't just use computers at all. Like if you are the type of person, <laughs> that, that's that's said without scorn. Like some people know. shouldn't be allowed to drive. Some people shouldn't be allowed to. Uh, or not allowed, but some people shouldn't be forced to use computers. Like, uh, you know, I have, uh, you know, the, 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 some of the some of the users that I think Connor was referring to before, uh, like the ones do, or you know, Wayne was referring to people who have got difficulties to switch from Outlook to Outlook Web. I don't think they'll be switching there. If they have a laptop or a PC at home, I don't think that's gonna that's that's gonna stand on Windows Ten until the thing doesn't power up. Like. And after that, they'll be they'll be they'll be going to PC World or whatever, and tearing their hairs off, saying, "Oh, I'm gonna have to buy the Windows 10 machine, and I'm gonna have to get used to it." But I don't think there's no changing them to do anything. They will go with the like most official option because yeah. Anyway, that's what I think. I have a, have a but, have a wee question for everyone just to stir the pot. Um, let me think about how I phrase this. Um, so. Like I know, there the, the this concept has been bandied about in the last while, where uh, Linux doesn't have a unified image the same way as a lot of other operating systems because they're commercial entities. So, with Linux, I think uh, Connor, you mentioned it a while ago that somebody said, uh, I think it was Jason Evangelo. To correct me if I'm wrong, he said uh, Linux needs a marketing department, basically. So yeah, Linux, uh, yeah, well, Jason, Linux yeah. needs to buy into capitalism, you know, greasy capitalism a little bit, and maybe you know refine the branding maybe seek out you know partnerships with with you know notable hardware companies you know do, you know how would you see that going like do do you think that would ever happen i think you've managed to silence us all <laughs> i i think i have an idea but like if if people say they they would like to see an image of linux like one desktop like mac or windows have I hope that will never happen ever. I, I guess in a, a Linux product, let's say. You know. Yeah, but but part of the product or the community or the or the project, part of the Linux thing is the choice, and that's mm. a USB. That's something the others don't have. So the fragmentation is something we have to learn to sell. It's a good thing. It's not something that we should be covering up because that's our advantage and that's how we can withstand one project failing because there are others to replace them. So. 
I think, yes, we definitely need marketing. We need to have better marketing, but we have to present it as a choice. If it means that some people might be slightly confused and we can do anything, we cannot do anything about that, I think that's fine because the, the, the choice is so important to Linux, then I don't think we can do anything else. I, I would I would say I can see I can see the both points of view. I can see um, um, Shane saying that there a kind of a standardized product. Um, I'm not saying that that necessarily detracts from the um, openness and the customization and the the choice within Linux. But again, it's the the case of what environment you're putting it into, what type of user you're presenting it fr- uh, in front of. Not everyone is going to be this curious, and the the choice would only end up confusing them so i for better or worse i think the what everyone is, seems to be standarding standardizing on is the gnome desktop because uh, certainly in the enterprise um space because uh red hat which is now um bought and backed by ibm is uh, gnome default canonical gnome default and so on and so forth so it's, it seems to be that that is the "Quote unquote holy grail of of desktop environments, and I'm not saying that I necessarily agree with that because I don't run GNOME on any on any of my computers, so I'm not saying that I'm one of those users. But there's the that point of view that, it, and then it gives them a single point to target. I mean, if you're a developer and saying, okay, um, I want to develop a Linux app, what do I do? Then there's there's a single point that they, that's what you target. Um, having said that, of course, there's going to be in, there's going to be enthusiasts, there's going to be meetups, there's going to be people who saying uh, who have a more refined opinion on it, um, saying, oh, I, d- I don't necessarily like GNOME, I prefer KDE, I prefer Cinnamon, I prefer Mate, uh, XFCE. Um, those people will always exist, but there is merit to having a single um, standard desktop environment that everyone can target or a single standardized image or something like that that is familiar uh as soon as you said product shane the first thought that went to my, into my head was red hat but then i i i don't know how to identify with red hat i i never really did i don't really use it i don't really use centos i might have thrown it on a server a couple of times and played around with but as soon as you said product i i was like okay red hat that's that's the product are but then as for image and marketing department I don't know why you guys use Linux, but I use Linux because I don't want to use Microsoft and I don't want to use Apple. And because my own personal values don't align with the values that those companies seem to put out there. Um, my own personal values don't align with very much, to be honest with you. But, but especially, especially in that computing uh, environment, I, I, I don't want to have a part of those. So I make a choice personally to use Linux because I care about... Uh, something that they don't care about. That's the, the the lightest way I can put it without getting even angrier than I am anyway. Um, <laughs> nonetheless, I don't know if people care enough. Linux is just another operating system. The fact that it has appeared on Android phones in its, in, in its shape or form, or the fact that it's a back end for servers, it just happens because the geeks are in those areas. And they create those services and make them available for the rest of the world to use. I don't even know where I'm heading with this, to be honest. I just realized I've been ranting for three minutes. But I, I, product, I don't know if Linux needs to be a product. Do, as Mark mentioned earlier, do we want the whole world on Linux or do we just want the people who want to be on Linux on Linux? For me, it was uh, curiosity um, because I just found it fascinating that there was an alternative in the first place and I thought and then you know I tried it out and it wasn't actually as difficult as I thought and I thought Jesus that's that's it's a whole new world really and I think that the baseline level of technical knowledge where computers are concerned anyway is is only going to increase um I think we're looking at if computer literacy was a measurable thing um I would say you know we're definitely in the minority of of in terms of understanding, you know, what's behind the, the the screen, you know, in terms of understanding the underlying technologies and how they work and how the internet works and how all those things zip around the world and, you know, put YouTube on your screen. Like the vast majority of people don't understand a lot of those concepts. So I think it's, it's only going to increase that knowledge. 
Um, more and more people are going to get more educated on it. They're going to get more in tune with their technology they're using and how it works and stuff. I mean, it has to happen. Um, so I think Linux is going to, Linux's day will come, I, I believe, like it will. Um, it's it's going to get to a point where things will democratize a little bit because what we're moving towards is web standards and they want to stream everything over the web nowadays. Like everything is moving towards being a web app and that's an open standard. So I think as soon as we reach that tipping point where, you know, we move away from native and more into like cloud and web-based, um, you know, apart from some things that I think we should keep on our local machines for obvious reasons. Um, but yeah, I think as it moves towards that, we're going to see a lot more engagement and the operating system won't matter as much at that point. You heard it here, folks. Um, 2020 is the year of the Linux desktop, according to Shane. <laughs> <laughs> no, 20, 2030 maybe, I don't know. But that's that's another whole uh, topic of conversation, though. The How open is the web and how open is it going to stay? Because you've got a lot of players coming in now that are building services uh, using open source software and then just putting proprietary stuff on top of it and, you know... I think that that is something really important that we have to be aware of the fact that we have an open web now and we might not have an open web uh, very soon. A lot of the web isn't open now. But anyway, I mean, that's kind of getting totally off the topic of what we were talking about. But it was just when you were saying it, I was going, <laughs> the, oh, my God, <laughs> this is how the ebb and flow goes with the new the clouds technology. are falling <laughs> like that's that's how. Yeah. It goes like I'm sure when the printing press was invented, like they they went through a period where it was revolutionary and everyone was reading words on paper and they thought that was fantastic and you know it could be distributed far and wide, and then I'm sure there came a point where people started to use it for more nefarious purposes because you know everyone believes what they what they saw on the written page at that point you know that was the truth at that point it was like the news twenty or thirty years ago like you didn't question what you saw on the news and. Uh, so I think we're just reaching those like growing pains with the internet. So people believe too much of what they read on it. And then they don't understand the power that a lot of the companies have who basically run the internet. Let's, let's face it. Um, it's all fake news. <laughs> but like, I think we're reaching a, a kind of a critical mass point where a lot more people will understand what exactly is going on, how it all works and how it can be misused. And, you know, I think we're due a bit of a, an enlightenment in that regard. Totally, I, I definitely get... due enlightenment as a society. <laughs> so yeah, did I just kill the conversation with a load of politics? <laughs> no, no, I mean, I, f I don't know. I can't even wrap my head around about the concept of the open web anymore because I don't think it's open. I don't think, I mean, it's democratic in the, fa in the way that the, the the five of us can come here and discuss stuff and broadcast it, which is something we wouldn't be able to do 50 years ago, like, not legally anyway. We could set up a pirate radio station and probably get punished for it, and it would also require a lot of equipment with, with a, uh, with a, uh, for, for, for a lot of money. So it is democratic in this point of view. Are we discoverable? We are because we are speaking to a niche, right? So people who look for Linux are at some point likely to discover us if we were just a political podcast or two political podcasts we wouldn't be nobody would find us unless we were somehow a be able to get the word out to someone bigger currently or did something you know so it is democratic it is open or not like uh, it is both some things are open some things are not and people of, uh, gra tend to gravitate to the not open things for whatever reason if it's by coincidence or i don't know why but you know what are people using the web for uh, your banking not open netflix youtube not open facebook definitely not open so and i don't think that's going anywhere um and uh yeah i don't even know where i'm going with this anymore but uh, well, I think, somebody I, I think you listed off you listed off a lot of companies there that are very prominent in in today's quote unquote open web standards that are very closed in their approach to web um web everything. So I totally agree with you. And they are you've mentioned off you mentioned some of the main players there, 
but I suppose there is I'm not the positive one on our show um, but there, I'll try and swing something around at least there is a bit of a platform for us to be able to say what we want to say even, even in this way and as you say even to people who are semi-interested in Linux but I'm, I often think that we're kind of preaching to our own a little bit um, the people who want to hear what do we have to say are the people who are already into this stuff rather than I don't know how many new people. I, I I don't know the answer to this. Yeah, jump in, please. Well, you could do what Hassan Minaj did. Not Hassan Minaj. Sorry. Uh, well, this is really bad. I confused the two comedians. Um, uh, well, anyway, you can do what the leftist uh, British comedian did at the charity dinner and get yourself pelted by bread because he was speaking lefty, leftist jokes to very right wing audience. Uh, do we want to do that? Do we want to go to like, uh, I don't know, uh, the close house proprietary convention of people against freedom and just tell them, uh, all right, guys, you are all wrong. You should be using our better superior ideas. Uh, or, uh, yeah, I mean, it's no one, everybody preaches to the choir, I think. You know, I don't, I don't actually... I don't actually know except on personal level. So 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 yeah, you might talk to your mates and say okay, well I know you are a really fanatical Nazi, but have you thought about this alternative and you might have a choice of persuading them. You know, or you you really like Windows or you now I equate Windows and Nazis. Well, that's not very good, is it? <laughs> I don't actually I don't actually think those two are equal, right? But uh, I I don't actually have anything against Windows users, believe it or not, or Windows themselves. But uh, some of my <laughs> best friends are the... Windows users. <laughs> <laughs> some, some of my best friends uh, don't have anything against Windows users either. Uh, 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 and uh, in the interest of digging the hole underneath myself even deeper, I think uh, I think that except for personal connections, we all just preach to the choir when we, especially when we speak in public. So. Uh, you know, you live, and that goes deeper. You live in the bubble that you want to live in. You, you know, I'm very unlikely. I've tried listening to No Agenda for a long time for just to be able to hear the opinions from the other side, and it's just made me depressed. You know, uh, I, I, I'm, and that I, I, I quit with that, and I'm unlikely to pick up anything like that again. You know, I'm gonna read the Guardian, not the Daily Mail, because you know I'm already angry yeah. enough. I have to think about my heart and stuff. You know, I want to see my seventies. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, and that's that's a lot of us. So yeah, we are preaching to the choir. We are talking to people who already are interested in Linux, and uh, I think that's fine. You know, so if people usually when they change, I think it's a kind of a either they follow someone they know or they are in they have it in themselves to uh, to, to kind of make to, to be curious they have the curiosity in the in themselves and in that case they'll find us by they found fi they will find us but uh, yeah again somebody please cut in again i lost the call. <laughs> I, I just want to say something there i was thinking of a slogan use linux it's good for your heart and you'll live until at least 70 years old <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm skipping a few apologies if i'm stepping on anyone's toes but uh I, I just noticed this question is great because coming up to christmas we all get some little stocking fillers and as a uh, computer and linux geeks um some of us have been gifted ra Raspberry Pis. I know I have in the past. Um, so how many Raspberry Pis do you have? And I think the answer is going to be a lot for most of us. Um, how many of them are in production? And uh, how many of them are just in a drawer gathering a, a thick layer of dust? <laughs> and, <laughs> is, is it possible that there are more Raspberry Pis in drawers than having a use case? Yes. I know that's true for me. I can see three of them just on the in a little bucket on the floor here. Hello, my name is Connor, and I actually do not own a Raspberry Pi, but I do own a, 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 a Rock sixty four. So um, um, the reason Once the reason you have why one single board computer, it's fine. I do I do have a single board <laughs> computer, so it's not a, a Raspberry Pi as such. Um, no, the reason why I was, I was very uh, when the the various generations of Raspberry Pis were coming out, and of course they're very inexpensive. The reason why I never picked one up is because I never really thought of a use case for one of them, and. Um, for my Rock 64, I've kind of used it as a uh, open a lek um, box or open a lek machine slash Samba server because it serves a, a dual purpose. And it was around the time when I when that 
was the the most powerful board for that purpose at the time. The Raspberry Pi four has come out since. So, um, but that the, that's the reason why I'm running the Rock sixty four. Yeah, I I have four Raspberry Pis. I I pre ordered the first one. Um, I got one in like the very one of the very first batches, and I was dead excited because it was only cost about forty quid with shipping and everything. So it was it was brilliant. And yeah, that was a that was a game changer. The Raspberry Pi. I made a point to get every new generation that came out. So I got. I didn't bother getting all the A plus and B plus ones and all that kind of thing. But uh, I just uh, I just went. Yeah, I have a Raspberry Pi one, two, three, four. <laughs> and I don't use them for anything. Any of them? <laughs> no, not one. Uh, one of them, the Raspberry Pi Four. I think I'm going to set up over the Christmas holidays as a as a, a Cody box. But I, what I really want to do is have like only three kind of main apps. I want to have Cody, Emulation Station, and Steam Link because apparently it works quite well through the Pi now. Um, oh yeah, yeah. And it has to be Ethernet. It's Wi-Fi is not an option, but it, that's no problem. Like we can get power line adapters and stuff. So um, yeah, I really want to try that out. But I really want to have an interface. I asked about this in the chat, and nobody had an idea. But like, I really want to have an interface of just like Cody uh, Emulation Station and um, what was the other one I said? Steam Link, and just have a, a chooser where you can just choose one of those three things. And I, I looked into like configuring open box and all these kind of things but i, I just can't i think you can just use uh so, sorry I, I think you can just use uh zenity or k dialog basically write a little bash script uh, or abjar in python basically when you start your raspberry pi it will present you with a window with three buttons and you'll be able to use your uh remote control to select any which of them you want that's what you want that's a right? good idea so you just just look there, there is, there are, for Python, it's called Abjar. It's a very simple UI library that you can do these simple little things with. Or you can use, obviously, you would be able to use Godot Engine to create something like this as well. Because that, you know, just, just all you want is three buttons in a window. I'm sure Godot can, you could, you could simply do it in Godot. You could probably put something together with, with uh, KDL or, in, or Zenity in, with using Bash you know, uh, as well. Just just make it run every, on every startup and to make sure you put exit button on that as well in case you actually want to use the underlying desktop and you yeah. should be sweet. Well, Zenity, how do you spell that? <laughs> uh, like Zenit with an I. Uh, sorry, yeah. I, I'll, I'll, I'll post it yeah, in the I'll show notes. I'll read the show notes and find that. And, uh, into the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> That's, uh... Okay, I... I... Telegrammed it. Anyway, I think it's called Zenit, if I remember correctly. There are, there are different extensions, like, like different programs that you can use to create simple UIs for, uh, for bash scripts. Like you don't have to, and not everybody has to be an Encurses expert to, yeah, to do these that's things. Yeah, it's interesting. Right? Um, yeah, so that could be a nice little project. Um, I'll report back in January when I haven't actually done it. <laughs> Look forward to hearing about that. Yeah. How about uh, Mark or Wayne? Do you have any old crusty Raspberry Pis in drawers, or are they actually dusted off and using? Uh, well, I do have this baby, a Picade, uh, which is really cool. Uh, that is using up one of my Raspberry Pi threes. Uh, I have a little, um, what you call it as well, uh, the Pi Hacker Radio or whatever it's called. Um, I have that. Uh, I also have a kind of a, a weather station thing, which is just sitting on a shelf at the moment and not actually doing anything. Um, and then I have, uh, I probably have another couple of Raspberry Pi 3s, uh, Raspberry Pi 2 and Raspberry Pi 1. My Raspberry Pi 1 was running my Pi Hole, but the SD card went on it. Um, so I just need to get around to using my Raspberry Pi 2 to do my Pi Hole now. But that that was months ago, so... I feel your pain, Shane. I have many ideas that I, I want to implement, but uh, they're always on the long finger. My long finger is like 10 miles long. But anyway. Yeah, I always think of ideas and work or something, and then I'll jot them down, <laughs> and then I'll just I'll be looking through my pockets in three months, and I'll find a bunch of pieces of paper with little ideas on them. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> nice. Well, I have 10 Raspberry Pis. Oh, my. I have four Raspberry Pi Zeros. 
and I have six Raspberry Pis. Well, ranging from two to three and three B plus. I have in production. <laughs> in production, I have some. So, for example, I have a Kodi box that sits up on a bedroom TV, a Kodi, a Kodi box that sits on a uh, the main TV in the living room, and the Kodi box in the living room also has a Pi TV hat on top of it. And that Pi TV hat actually feeds TV up to the bedroom TV, and that's really amazing. Actually, that Pi TV hat I think is probably one of the best Pi add-on boards I ever bought because it's also acting as a. I've also got just a hard drive. Uh, attached to that um, to that Raspberry Pi that's downstairs, and that acts as a basically a DVR for recording off the TV and stuff. So, th- so that's been quite a, that's some of I, some of the better side of my setup. I've got a few when I was playing with Motion iOS. Are you familiar with Motion iOS? It's a small security camera Pi system. That's worth a look. Actually, it's very simple to set up. You burn an image onto a onto an SD card and shove it into your Pi and. Um, yeah, and that's just one or two suction caps on Windows things. And, and you can have three or four Pies going at the same time. And they all feed back to a central central um, unit for, I don't know, for, for surveillance. It's for more frog just porn. me. For what? <laughs> for frog porn. For frog porn. That's a whole other story. I don't know if this is the show for that. But, um, <laughs> I had one. <laughs> I'll, I'll post a link to that as well if you're really interested. Um, I had one where I was testing out a um, oh, what's it called? That's gonna. Oh, it's not Freedom Box. It's the other one. Unohost. Why Unohost? Which is a centralized hosting system where you have a whole lot of apps. One of which is a matrix server, actually. Um, it's, it's got the Synapse app on it. It's even got Nextcloud on it, so you can install this Unohost. Why Unohost? On a on an SD card, it's a flashing an image thing and you install the apps that you want and you can open up that to the wider internet if you wish. Um, and Yeah, so I've got, I would like to say about half of them are in production. Yeah, it's a, um, they're very, very, uh, well, the, the whole point of uh, Raspberry Pis and other similar um, uh, single port computers such as the, the, the Rock 64 and the Rock 64 Pro from Pine 64 and there's Odroid and, and whatnot. I mean, Odroid are e- even so crazy that I think they, they basically took the, the top of the line um, Samsung Exynos like 8 core uh, processor and because his arm is like okay we're just going to stick this on a, on, on a single board computer and of course that does need um, external um cooling so it has a massive fan on on it as well but an immensely powerful computer so um a hard kernel i think is the the website they get odroid from so there's various um places you can get those kind of single board computers and of course various projects that have been developed for all these single board computers the most um, most community support is obviously for the Raspberry Pi with people um, making the additional boards as you said were just kind of s- um, slaps onto the G- uh, GPIO pins um, at the top um, yeah it's um, I mean there's there's Oh, just off the top of my head, um, it's not a use case that I would necessarily be interested in the short term, but maybe in the long term, people have come up with like um, a, a, a piece of software that is, they sit on a Raspberry Pi and turn the Raspberry Pi into basically uh, like automated home brewing. Um, is it brew pie or something like that? Oh, yeah. Um, Graham pie. Morrison did that, yeah. Uh, yeah, so really, really fascinating projects. So it's 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 almost it's almost uh, overwhelming. It's almost like which one do I actually pick when uh, when, when you're getting your single board computer? Yeah, I remember that. I remember hearing about that on Linux Voice back in the day. Um, yeah, Graham Morrison. Uh, Linux Voice. Yeah, yeah, it was that was my first Linux podcast. Um, mm. But Graham Morrison had set up that brew pie. I think it was him actually. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was him. And uh, yeah, he said you needed the. Uh, some some part of the mechanism from a fridge, uh, so you had to do an old fridge and you get an old fridge and, and like wire it in some way to the controller and, but it would output all this data about the heating of the yeast and it would do it just on the right like peaks and everything and I don't understand was brewing but yeah I'm, was I'm it Graham sure. or Ben because I mean Ben was always doing mad stuff as well could have been Ben yeah I think yeah, it was Ben yeah, Everard but uh, yeah. no I don't know but I'm trying to s- uh, whatever. I'll pull out that that, that that issue of Linux Voice that I have lying around somewhere. <laughs> 
Ben actually set up a nerf. Uh, ben actually set up a Nerf gun on his on his Raspberry Pi that he had. Uh, oh, Any time right. there was a motion, he had a motion sensor on it, and anytime his cat walked by, he she got a load of um, sort of Nerf pellets. <laughs> oh, I think it was actually guarding like a plate of cookies or something and connected to a motion motion sensor. If you were reached for them, they would ah, yeah. get shot. Yeah, and it's been used in weapons of mass destruction. If anybody wants to <laughs> <laughs> Raspberry Pi. <laughs> Yeah. You've been uh, pied. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Imagine if there was actual pie on the end of a of a shooting mechanism so you walk into there you get actual pie shot in I your bet face. it's doable. Yeah. Just in case Bart Johnson hey. turns around. Yep. Um <laughs> Moving swiftly on, uh, another <laughs> another topic that caught my eye was uh, what hardware would we like to see on Linux or see Linux on? Now, that's an interesting one. Oh, yes. Well, I think, like, what, what, what hardware that isn't exists or currently in the pipeline, to me, it would be a decently priced but very well specced phone. Like, I would actually like to see that generally, like, because that kind of thing doesn't exist anywhere. Everything is either shit or overpriced. And uh, so, at least in my experience, like, to me, okay, to just some context, to me, paying 300 euros for a phone is not... Not, not, it's, it's not something I want to do. I'm philosophically opposed uh, to wasting so much money on, on, on a small, tiny pocket computer that is amazing or could be amazing, but really doesn't do all that much compared to a real mm, computer, right? Enough. So I think to me, basically the price of a Pine phone, but the, the hardware that you can find, let's say in the iPhone, uh, maybe not with the camera. I don't care that much about that. But uh, with a, a decent Linux system on it, right? Or, or a, you know, or maybe some nice, nice hardware like uh, not necessarily a Qualcomm chipset, but on par with whatever is in the gal- in the newest galaxies, you know. So, I know that's probably not doable at this point because everybody's charging exorbitant amounts for the chipsets and the, and all the components, and then you have the labor that you have to put together, but. That if if we ask what fictional device I'd like to see, it would be that. Um, it doesn't exist at the moment, but probably something um, a- akin to what you're expecting. Um, and I think that the rumours are is that it's it is in development, but um, obviously it, they're waiting until the Pine Phone actually comes out. Yes, but it could be like something like, I mean, to follow the logical pro- progression. They have a Pine Book, and now they have a Pine Book Pro. And they've a Pine Phone, maybe a Pine Phone Pro, um, and even if you're saying okay, the the Pine Phone is is one hundred and fifty dollars, let's say double it, and that's your three hundred dollar mark, but it's it's, uh, it's substantially insane. more powerful than than the the Pine Phone is at the moment, but it's it, they're doing it in the in the right philosophy, as in introduce something that's that's inexpensive um get it out there get the projects used to it in other words um the fact that <coughs> that um, manjaro has builds for the the pine uh, book pro now and they're they've teased there's in alpha that they have builds for the pine phone as well um running um their the K- kd plasma that's designed more for phone interface so you'd have manjaro running on your phone um, yeah, get, get the get the boards out there, get the people tinkering on them, and then it'll be a, a more natural uh, progression to moving to more advanced um, single board computer um, later on because they've they've already familiar with the project. I, I am dying for a, a large well, Linux I, and- uh, tablet. That's what I want. Um, something with like build good build quality doesn't have to be super powerful. But yeah, or or a big, large e-reader kind of jotter pad thing. I've seen proprietary ones uh, with an e-reader screen that you can draw on and stuff and write. And it has OCR recognition and everything for your handwriting. And I'd love to see something like that on mm. Linux. Oh, yeah, that would Sounds be nice. Cool. Like an mm, e-ink yeah. display, yeah? Always, always. <laughs> I too would actually be really into that. Well, both the tablet and the phone, and I can't really um, sort of discount. We're talking fictional world, and I know you mentioned um, some high specs with a high specs with a, a low price point. Um, that's our 
That's our favourite tagline as well. But um, the, 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 I think what you probably, I know fictional, but when I think of the companies that actually have done this, it's been uh, companies who are going to ship thousands of phone. And we're back to this Linux minority groups, you know, who where they'll sell a handful of phones um, unless people start caring about what exactly traffic is going in and out of their phones and stuff. But yeah, a, a decent quality phone, uh, a Linux phone, and, and likewise a Linux tablet as well. But I am holding out for what PinePhone have on offer, actually, and um, excited to see what they do bring to the marketplace, for want of a better word. And um, I have to sort of respect them for at least going down that road, because from whatever I've read so far, it hasn't been an easy road to follow at all. But um, so I'm actually just looking forward to um, to see what they bring out. I think actually Android is could be a massive help in there. You see, as far as I understand it, and arguably... It might, I might be thinking wrong here, right? But uh, Android is extremely inefficient in the way it uses resources because everything is a virtual machine. Everything runs on Java and it's not the world's most efficient way of using the processors. Now, that means that if you want to make a, li- a Linux phone that doesn't have this, that, that runs uh, C++ apps or, you know, a, a, your normal normal, uh, normal way of, of, you know, like a lightweight Linux applications without that Java overhead, you can actually use components that are not the top of the not the top of the yeah, yeah. Uh, not the top of the class at this moment, but they would you would achieve the same speed as you would on Android. You know, so like by mean speed, by I mean speed of experience. So uh, we could. Uh, so I think that could be that could be something to consider because if you you know they would not necessarily have to buy the top notch. And the most expensive chipsets they can buy last year's or two years ago chipsets, two years old chipsets, and still achieve the same experience as Android. Yeah, it's a really good point. In that vein, I think the the most um, mature um, that I've experienced. I'm not saying there isn't one that's equally mature that um, that's out there. Just haven't experienced it. Is the um, UB ports with their with their Ubuntu um, touch and also um, Sailfish OS. I mean, I have a I have a one plus one phone running um, the UB ports Ubuntu touch implementation, and I also have a, a Sony Xperia XA two running um, Sailfish OS, and both of them seem to be very actively developed. Um, the um, and the user interface is completely different, so you you, you kind of have to get used to each another's um, swiping paradigm when you're moving from one to the other. Um, the one that once thing that slightly nods in the direction for the sailfish os for me for the moment is their their very robust um android app support um i'm not saying to you, like you it's for the ca- one or, the use case of maybe one or two apps in other words 90 percent of your use case is non-android but the one or two apps that you find oh that that's handy you can kind of stick um f droid on on um the sailfish os uh, phone and you would have the sail or the f droid um, apps and they also have their own they they don't have a uh, the official google play store but they have their own kind of Android app store integration um that does updates and everything like, like that so you can go out and you can find your your um your signal messenger or your whatsapp or whatever through their Android store and that will handle the updates as well um early days but the the more you get uh, um devices out there and the more you get um people using the devices uh that will incentivize more developers to to work on it and therefore we get more stable and these the um the use user interface and the uh, running of the operating system will only get um smoother and more uh, bug free in the long term which is part of the reasons why i i 100 percent behind the whole pain by uh, pine 64 philosophy of make it inexpensive and get it out there because then that's the best way to to uh, improve the user experience how many of you will buy a Pine phone? Yeah, sorry, so that's not a good that's not a good radio. This, so I'm I'm putting my head up. Wayne is putting his yeah, hand up. Uh, yeah. Connor as well is saying. 
Okay. I'm, I'm going to buy the, everything. I, yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> that's, that's the thing. Everything that's in the, the world. It's a great thing with these open community oriented devices that they like, it's very simple to, to get interested in your project and they just, they just hit upon it in exactly the right way. I mean, that's how you do it. You, you create something that's not inexpensive. It's low powered, you know, nobody really cares. They're just like, Ooh, I can put my thing on it. And then everyone's happy like that and then you just build on that and you're going to have a more you, in terms of a, the bottom line and business from a business point of view sure you might not make a lot of money at the beginning but you're just investing in you know your profits in the future because the second you release something that's you know viable as a as a main device or a, a day-to-day device that someone can put linux on someone can hack someone can go in and do whatever they need to do on it, then you've got a guaranteed customer base straight yeah. away. And I suppose that the only reason why I'm not, well, it's not the only reason, but one of the reasons why I'm not getting a Pine phone is if I got another phone, I'd be killed stone dead. <laughs> <laughs> I have too, too many phones lying around at I, this I, stage. But anyway. I have way too many phones. I mean, those two, aforementioned two devices are not my main daily driver. Uh, my main uh, daily driver is, um, is a OnePlus 5T. And as no by no means the the latest and greatest. I mean, I think the the, the one plus seven pro. I think is the latest at the moment. But uh, so, yeah, so, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, the, um, it's a couple of generations old. But I'm looking at it, saying this is fundamentally good hardware. The camera on it is 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 brilliant. Everything like that. So if uh, in an ideal world, um. Uh, I mean, which, which is what the the Pine Phone is trying to do is that there be multiple projects would have images for your phone that you have in your hand because you your your phone has good hardware. So I would I would absolutely love to be my phone to be officially supported and say, oh, I'm I'm thinking about trying out Sailfish OS and going to their Sailfish OS website and says, yep, we have a build for your your OnePlus Five T or uh, or going on to um. Uh, UB ports and saying eh, we have Ubuntu Touch for your OnePlus 5T and and who knows I might just like uh, I'm um, distro hopping on my on my desktop well um, not for a, uh, a long time but it, it, you know when you get that kind of itchy feet feeling of yeah I, w- I might want to try something else I mean that I would love for that to have uh, to happen on my phone because it's it's fundamentally very good solid hardware. Yeah, and because it's so inexpensive, I mean, you have that freedom because you can just, it's not your main phone. You don't really care if you brick it. It's its not a huge deal. So, you, you know, you're you're just going to experiment more and that's going to... Well, know, for clarification, my, my, one, my OnePlus 5T is my main phone. <laughs> it, yeah, well, my, I have my 6T as well. It is, it is fantastic. There is definitely one piece of hardware that I would like to see coming in so we are because that, that i was just reminded of it when um when shane said that it's inexpensive well yeah it is to us uh in here in the west we can afford most of us buy you know some stuff from from ebay but uh the rest of the world is not living in in these conditions like there is a billion most of the planet doesn't have that kind of money or or means of getting these devices so i would like to see and most of them are living on like cheap phones either cheap android phones or kios phones or even feature phones are still big in many places i would like to see at some point a linux phone that is built for uh unstable connections that has got things that the people there need like durability waterproof waterproofness waterproof whatever water resistance uh i know they are not the same things uh dust that being dustproof and running a free and open uh, operating system like Linux based, but one that's like not for tinkerers, something very reliable and at a, at a price that, uh, like if maybe if somebody made it and give it to local operators so that they can give it for free with a, with a, uh, with a, you know, on a pay as you go, even. They're expensive so things to develop, though, like waterproof and yeah, the, dustproof and all that kind of jazz. It really adds to the but cost. That's been uh, for no, ages, the, you know. So, I, Mike, uh, yeah. you're um, asking, uh, in my opinion, you're, you're asking for uh, a lot uh, in terms of uh, th- your. 
and, and, and then asking for it in addition to be it should be at a very low price point. I mean, you have to get your your R and D back somehow. But these things already exist in our kind of low price point. So you can get. Um, I think you can get like waterproof phones that are not the prettiest around, but they and they run some oldish version of Android, but they might be about two hundred fifty. You know, so there are brands in China that are actually doing this kind of uh, 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 this kind of uh, what do you call it uh, this kind of you know they, 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 they have got the waterproofness in them uh, but and I've the technology has been around for a while so I think it's it must get it's, it's must gotten cheaper so I'm just thinking that for the what do they call it like the next billion people who need to be connected or something some cliche like this it would be nice if the device they are connecting from the base had an open uh, open source operating system could i mention the uh, gnu linux power pc notebook yeah. That's something i would like to see happen oh yeah why power pc why not because it's great <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, uh, um, they're actually doing a they're doing a, a fundraising. That's the word, isn't it? Fundraising campaign at the moment, trying to get the money together to uh, have a an open open hardware for the on for the power PC and everything. And um, I'm just really excited about it. And unfortunately. The donation campaign isn't really going well. It really looks like it's stalled. Uh, they're looking for twenty four grand only, and um, at the moment it's sitting at four thousand seven hundred, which is kind of what it's been sitting at for most of last month. You know, Maybe um, we can put a link to that it's unfortunate. The show notes. Yeah, I I think we should. I mean, I've donated myself, but I suppose I, I'm one of the few. <laughs> It was, uh, I mean, it looks, it looks great. And like, I mean, PowerPC is just a far more modern chip design than, you know, your i386 Intel stuff. I mean, the basic architecture of that is going back to the 70s, whereas, I mean, PowerPC is what, 90s or whatever, you know? So, um, you know, it's much more modern design, more capable, uh, as they say themselves, it's the right time to make new choices, you know. Um, and actually, what's their name? Slimbook uh, have partnered with this crowd. Uh, they've created a, a laptop chassis and everything. It'd be a great thing to see happen. Mm. Yeah, we're definitely due a paradigm shift of some description. Mm. Uh, I don't mean to detract from from what Mark was saying there and that PowerPC um uh, crowdfunding does certainly sound like um, something that's very interesting. Um, a possible alternative, and I'm not saying it's an, it's a viable alternative at the moment, but it could be that's something to look out f look for in the in the future is um, the Risk Five architecture and the fact that that's open. So uh, maybe maybe yeah, yeah. Um, that could um, integrate better with with Mike's idea of having an, an expensive phone that you could give out to everyone. Maybe the the cost of R and D on that would be less than if 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 that can if that phone was ARM based or something like that because of licensing and whatnot. So that could be a, a possible um viable alternative to to that. Yeah, risk five in a phone maybe, but I don't know if you'd have the power for it in a laptop. Yeah, yeah. It's, I, I think Risk Five is is an ARM alternative. In the, in the same ways, you don't really see ARM laptops. Mm. You don't really. See, I don't anticipate you seeing a Risk Five laptop. But yeah, um, power PC use would certainly be more akin to the more desktop slash laptop um, usage paradigm. Well, you have a Pinebook Pro with an ARM laptop, yeah. so I'm sure uh, Risk Five is going to get there as well. Yeah. So we've had a, a long winding discussion today it was nice to uh it was nice to have that freedom to just have a christmas waffle i wonder what a christmas waffle would taste like <laughs> <laughs> it probably tastes very nice um <laughs> snow and happiness yes. um so imagine if it was free too without further ado i think we'll move on to our shout outs our socials uh we'll both do our uh our individual shout outs and mentions of of the various uh ecosystems we find ourselves on uh I'll, 
Wayne, Mark, do you guys have any uh, things you'd like to shout out? Well, um, well, it's been. Firstly, I just want to say it's been nice to have to talk to everybody here, to be sitting here in this virtual room and being able to exchange ideas. Um, thanks to all those involved in making that happen. Um, well, you can find us, of course, at thebinarytimes.net. Do send us an email at info at thebinarytimes.net. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening. That's all I have to say on it, really. Um, as for us, you can find us in the usual places. Uh, you can email us on show at linuxlads.com. Linux, linuxlads.com, of course, is the website. You can find us on Twitter at linuxlads. You can find us on uh, Mastodon. Did I get that right, Mike? Yes, I always forget about Mastodon. Linuxlads.com forward slash Mastodon. And of course, we're on Facebook, but don't go on that because we don't care. Um, <laughs> One so, thing I will uh, say, um, we're, we're also on Telegram and... Oh yeah, um, the Telegram group, of course. And also, uh, the this is the last episode before our break for Christmas and um, the aforementioned Christmas waffles that, I, I suppose, we're all going to ho- go off and see what would that actually entail and maybe look up a recipe and see if we could actually make <laughs> a Christmas waffle. Um so we'll probably be back sometime in January after our Christmas break. So th- I think this is due to be our last one before our Christmas break. That's right. But don't worry, there will be one more binary times before the end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> so we all have that to look forward to. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> So, uh, thanks for staying with us. Uh, big thanks to uh, Wayne and Mark for coming along and uh, joining us for this uh, dual episode. Um, it was a lot of fun. I really liked the discussion. It was cool. Um, so, uh, without further ado, I've been Shane. I've been Connor. I've been Mike. I've been Wayne. And I've been very excited to do this show. <laughs> that wasn't in alphabetical order. <laughs> Bye. Bye. See ya. Bye now.